Welcome, Tony. I'm so happy and grateful to have you here with me. How are you today? I'm, I'm very well, Catherine. It's a lovely, beautiful morning here in Brisbane, Australia, and it's always exciting to be talking to you. Thanks so much. We just mentioned it's 5 a.m. at your place <laughs> and 8 p.m. at my place. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's very interesting how technology works. It's a like, little bit of a different version of the 5 a.m. club. Normally you're out there doing some sort of exercise at this particular time in the morning, but uh, instead I'm talking with you, which is amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Sharma, for 5 a.m. club, but I'm just not that kind of a person. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to talk to you, Tony, about leadership today. I believe yeah. now in these times of uncertainty, that's very, very important topic, especially now. So what defines a great leader? Um, Catherine, I, I think great leaders today um, have the potential potential to have been a great leader throughout history because one of the things that I, I see with leaders is that they're always evolving so as a community standards evolve as our expectations evolve I think great leaders evolve with them and so um, so I think that the first point I just want to make about that is that, that I think great leaders today would have been a great leader potentially at any time in history but one of the key things that I see with leadership and and I'm a a real advocate for values-based leadership. As you know, I'm a member of the John Maxwell team and, and I believe that when you've got that core aspect of leadership that uh, is formed and built around values, I think that that will always stand you in great stead. And I actually take it to the next step and I, I actually developed um, a leadership model called the anatomy of a leader. And it really is about having a strong core, which is about can your character and your credibility and what I call calling. So, you know, the purpose behind the leadership, uh, behind the leader. Um, so a strong core, a service heart, and what I call a transformational mind, which is where your discipline and your results come through. So I think for great leaders of today, if they can concentrate first on getting their core right, that character, um, their credibility, and really aligning with their calling, um, serve their team, which is from the service heart, supporting them, developing them, but also providing them structure because I think that's really important. So many leaders don't provide their team the, the structure that they need. And then the final step for me is always about that, that mindset, that desire, the discipline and the drive to create great leadership. So when they all come together, when they're all in alignment, you will see a great leader absolutely love this especially the part about being in <clears throat> on the path of our own calling or a purpose it's so transformative when you actually realize what is the best that you can offer to the world and, and you just yeah. do that it, it goes with the flow it's not the struggle anymore it's actually very easy but I still yeah. see a lot, a lot of leaders who are actually behaving as bosses and yeah. who are actually more of managers than leaders. And I, I believe that leadership is not perfectly clear to, to everyone who is, who is in that, on, on that position. Like there is a position of leadership and there is a leadership as an inspiration and actually a purpose. But yeah. in these times of uncertainty and crisis, what would you say, uh, what do they need to do? Like, what's the most needed from a leader when it comes to this, like, it's, I will say mess, like the whole world is <laughs> now with this pandemic, really? And uh, it's easy to be the leader now. Like, really, I think it's very, very difficult. I um, There's no doubt, Catherine, that COVID has changed our world forever. And uh, the levels of anxiety, depression, um, our, our state of mind, um, along with <laughs> the actual health concerns of COVID, um, has certainly brought a lot of flux within the world. So from a leadership perspective, I, I think leaders um, need to create a, in this particular um, time, especially a calming 
pro, um, a calming atmosphere. So people are scared, people are fear, fearful, people are fixated. So one of the things that happens in a crisis is that we narrow our vision. So people will narrow their vision and it will become individually based. So some people will say it's selfish, but the reality is that we take care of ourselves first and then we look after others. And one of those things that happens because of that narrowing focus, it, it becomes difficult for people to focus on anything outside of their own personal circumstances. And let's face it, everyone has had an impact in some way, shape or form with what's happened with COVID. And the reality for a leader is that it, even though we acknowledge the times are uncertain, it really is up to a leader to provide a calming or some level of certainty to allow their people to prosper. Um, your number one priority as a leader is always to look after your people, always to develop them, always to communicate with them, serve, and funnily enough, care. And that, it, that in itself is a challenging good times for some leaders. But, um, but that's the key. That's really the, key, the critical key. The, the crisis has exposed many leaders. It, it really has. They've either showed, um, a leader has either shown up or been showed up. And um, the key things that I see in a crisis is that leaders that have had that service heart have really led well for their team or their people or their followers. Um, and funnily enough, they've achieved the best results and their team have had less angst and less health issues. But, but I think um, during that, a leadership, uh, leaders are either revealed or exposed and we've seen that right around the world. Um, and we either show up or we get shipped out. So, so I think that's really critical for a leader. Calming, um, some level of certainty, even though they may not have understood where they were going themselves, the reality is that the leader's got to care for their team. And those leaders that have done that have been able to continue to achieve great results and continue to have a team that's on board with a broader focus or a broader vision as outside of that indi um, individual personalised focus that a lot of people come into in terms of a crisis. And we actually witness that every single day, even just from watching news. I don't watch TV anymore. That's, that's one of the decisions I made. But it definitely COVID teached us a lot. Like what yeah. you just said, I've noticed a huge shift from control like some yeah. leaders really were control based to actually care and kindness based so the leadership yeah. kindness is taking over the leadership yeah. freedom is taking over the inspiration so what i see is a huge shift of actually the mindset and those leaders are just showing up on the surface and no one expected that yeah because they might usually be perceived as weak uh, yeah. not as the strong strong leaders they, they, they really are. So Absolutely. There is one thing that they should do or know at these times. What would that be? It's always so hard to pinpoint that one thing. But to me, I'm going to sort of nail off that one thing with a number of things. So, so I think what we're seeing in the world at the moment is a bit of an evolution of leadership. And, and we're talking more in line with leaders being coaches, um, which, I, which I think is, is amazing, much needed and well-deserved. And, and I believe the greatest skill and mindset that a need a lead needs right now is the ability to be able to coach. And as you know, the ability to coach and lead will help people perform um, because it involves a, a couple of skills that, let's face it, People call them soft skills, but soft skills, as you and I both know, are often the hardest and the most difficult for people to master. But when we're talking about coaching, we're talking about discovery and we're talking about the belief that the people have the answer within. So all of a sudden there's a whole mind, minds being blown by leaders everywhere because instead of them having to believe or... or um, bluster their way through having the right answer 
the belief that the person or the team member has the right answer all of a sudden creates a different mindset. But it also incorporates quality listening, you know, actually listening to someone instead of just waiting for your opportunity to reply or to tell the person what you think. It becomes quality listening. It's curious questioning. It's about asking the questions. It's about having empathy, understanding. But there's also that, um, that, that aspect of holding people accountable. So it's not just this warm and fuzzy sort of a feeling and we're sitting around a campfire singing Kumbaya. It's, it's about really diving in, asking those questions, listening with um, being really active with their listening, having empathy, understanding, um, and then holding people accountable. And, and then one of the really key things, um, Catherine, I was thinking about this last night, was the leader needs to suspend their need to be right. So, mm. so they need to suspend their need to be right. So when we believe we're right, we aren't listening to anything else. We aren't listening to um, anybody else. We're not seeking to understand. What we're doing is just waiting our turn to tell people we're right. So for leaders truly to become coaches, we've got they've got to suspend their need to be right. They've got to listen actively they've got to ask curious questions they've got to have really strong rapport and empathy within their team and then ultimately once the once the outcome has been or all the actions have been determined by the the particular team member then it's a case of okay we're holding you accountable and this is what we're going to do so i think coaching helps people unlock their people uh, unleash potential and you can do that as a leader when you develop coaching ability. So I think the number one thing that a leader should be thinking about right now is how do I become a better coach, not a better manager, not a better process, not a better tick and flick merchant, not a better person with a clipboard. This is about coaching and it's really about helping your team get the right answer without having to direct in an autocratic way. This is brilliant and it's truly very wise and deep. I never thought about it in that way, although I do work as a coach and obviously we, we lead our teams. And But on, on a higher scale, like on a higher level of leadership, even when we speak about political leadership, imagine how huge shift that would be if, mm. you know, stepping from an ego-based leadership, we step to coaching-based leadership. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, really, it's huge. It's, un yeah. it's unlimited potential, right? Absolutely unlimited. And one of the other things that it actually helps the leader with, every now and again, a leader, you know, there's a lot of leaders that think they need to have the answer. Um, but every now and again, you don't have the answer. So by actually developing your coaching skills and asking questions, A, it gets input from the people that are most directly um, affected by your leadership but it also helps you um, buy yourself some time and space so that you can start to be thinking through it yourself so so instead of just saying the first thing that comes out of your mouth which is what also under a number of leaders do um, it buys time it buys you some time and space to actually think about it and be thoughtful about it and it's as simple as understanding what a great question looks like. And when we ask great questions as leaders, we are going to get better outcomes from our team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, so deep. And I, I, I love this. I would like that everyone actually realize that when, if they are on a leadership position. I, yesterday, I think I watched one video by Gary Wee and someone asked him, what is the best thing we can do for our team? And he just answered, listen. Mm, absolutely. And it's it seems such a simple concept, but it's just so hard for some to implement. And, and it's because of that, you know, often our ego gets in the way. Often it's because we just need to be right. Often it's because we've got an outdated belief of what a leader and a manager should be doing. Um, if I'm not giving them the answers, what are they going to think of me as a leader? Well, they're probably going to think more of you as a leader if you can help them come to the answer. So, so there's a number of things that go into that space. But I think if people learn to listen, 
really, truly, deeply listen and not just giving the appearance of listening. Um, I, I believe that that's going to be a quantum leap for a number of a number of managers and leaders out there. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree. Now we're going to have some fun and we're going to, to shift to that fast and furious part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> I'll give it my best. <laughs> so I will ask you a very quick questions and you have like 10 seconds to answer me. Okay. And you will hear ring bell when the time is up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's spice it up a little bit. Let's go. So um, who influenced you as a leader? Sorry? Who influenced you as a leader? Um, I'm a member of the John Maxwell team. John's my greatest influence. So um, I truly align to his values-based leadership teaching. Along my journey, I've had many leaders that have influenced me, but, um, you know, John's the one that has certainly resonated the most with me. Brilliant. And just uh, off the record, what, what specifically is uh, so unique about his leadership? I think John comes from a um, so John's comes from a faith-based background. Um, I'm not necessarily as strong in the faith as what John is. John used to be a pastor, mm -hmm. but um, but I look at it from from a really um, the values based, the humanity based. It's it just makes sense to me the way that John um, puts the leadership principles into place, and I think that's why John has been so successful in what he does because he's not just appealing to the faith-based communities, he's appealing to the broader base and he's got this crossover and um, because people can identify how to um, put those values-based leadership um, principles into place. So the first book I ever bought from John was, a, was I found in a bargain basement box at a, at a bookstore and it was like two bucks and it's a book called Leadership Gold and, um, and, Ever since that day, I just couldn't get enough of John Maxwell. So I just kept buying his books. And um, there's never been a book that's disappointed. Um, and, you know, when, when I get an opportunity to see John on stage at our conferences, it, it's just, um, it's always inspirational and it always helps me get clarity around where, what my next stages are. Brilliant. I hope that answered. Yeah. I love I love that because you are one of the people who inspired me. So I definitely need to dive <laughs> deeper into his work and see what's behind the scenes. Okay. So is that the book who gave you which gave you like the greatest influence or which funnily book? enough, the, the book that I that I see as really helping. I mean, I've got two main books that I I, I share all of John's works, but But there's two books that I really put into play as a leader, and one's called Crucial Conversations by a guy called a lady called Kerry Patterson, mm -hmm. um, and it's just a, a book that helps people have those conversations that you should be having that you don't necessarily have. So it really helps people um, create a shared outcome, build some trust and some safety in a conversation. Um, and it, it follows a seven-step process, so you can actually sit back and prepare. And, and understand when a conversation is going wrong. So that one, um, when I read that, I was able to put that straight into practice as a leader. And the other book that really was powerful was a book called Seeing Red Cars by Laura Goodrich. And um, this is a book that I read way back in, way back in 2012. And um, it's, it's Red Cars is about, um, it's a very simple premise is that we, We get what we focus on and often we focus on what we don't want. And so the book shifts that. And, and so, and once again, Laura's provided a great process that you work through. I think that's probably the first book, Catherine, that I started working with on chapter two, that I just wanted to start doing the exercises. Normally when I read a book, um, I, I go cover to cover and then I'll go back and work on some of the the worksheets that most books now nowadays give you but with um laura's book straight into it i i just it was just so compellingly different um and it just a, a it, it's a book that allowed me to focus so 
course, there's others. There's Speed of Trust by Stephen Covey Jr., which is just a, a powerful book. And then he followed that up with Smart Trust. But, but yeah, Crucial Conversations by Kerry Patterson and Seeing Red Cars by Laura Goodrich, definitely books that provided me great outcomes. And, and I think that's really important. So Wonderful. I, I, I didn't hear about them. So, yeah, I definitely need to check it out. Um, what's the most beautiful thing about being a coach? Now, this is going to sound a little bit strange, but I love seeing the lights come on. So, you know, when I'm, when I'm working with someone, I'm building rapport with them and being able to truly help them see something for themselves, you know, maybe for the first time, maybe it's something that they've blocked away, you know, seeing those, that glimmer of hope or that gleam come back into their eyes. That's the thing that I really love about coaching and just to see them then take, tr- take that gleam and turn it into action and get them moving in the direction of where they should be going. You know, that's what I, what I truly love. And, you know, I, I, I work with um, high-level leaders. I work with um, a lot of frontline leaders and first-time leaders. And then I'll work with people in who, um, you know, I'm, I'm helping from a community aspect. Um, and the joy is, is the, the joy is always the same when you get that little glitter in their eyes that, and that they've got that life back. And, you know, because everyone at all those levels all have their own... Um, blocks their own hiccups their own issues and being a coach helps me um, ex- explore that with them and you know that's just uh, I, I just get goosebumps thinking about it because that's what just keeps me going in that particular space I, I just love coaching and uh, and just love seeing the life return so yeah it's not strange it's the same for me like absolutely (laughs) the same that's the most beautiful thing you know when you see joy in their eyes and they that oh that's an aha moment now i can do this to to make a difference yeah you know even i have coaches like (laughs) for everything and (laughs) you know when you realize that it's much smarter to work with someone who can show you the way than to dig your own way yeah it's you know it's something that that's truly truly beneficial um tell us where people can find you how they can reach out to you and what we can expect from your magic this year (laughs) Um, well i've got a number of paths that people can find me the the best way is probably to find me on linkedin um just do a quick search for tony curl if you do a google search for tony curl um i'm pretty certain that you'll be able to find me um one of the, the the things that have happened with obviously the evolution of the internet is that um, you've got to own your name. So I certainly own my name on Google search. And unfortunately, there's an actor in England who's actually called Tony Curl and um, he's relegated to like page two of Google. And um, I, I do apologize. I do feel sorry for him. But, um, but yeah, if, if, if people well, just Google me, they'll certainly find do. me. Oh, well, you know, I can't change the algorithms for Google, unfortunately. Um, but, um, yeah, and probably coachcurl.com is probably the easiest one to, for people to remember. I'd love to connect. I, I've got a, a, a group on Facebook called the Coach Curl Academy where we um, help people um, just uh, provide tips and tricks, and there's a number of different units in there around getting discipline and motivation. So, And that's a totally free platform. Uh, for people if they're interested. But the best way, just probably Google me or to go to coachcurl.com and um, I'd love to connect with them. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being my guest. I truly enjoyed it and I hope you did too. No worries. It's been wonderful as always. Thanks, Catherine. My pleasure. Bye. <laughs>